Now we are moving into another very interesting topic, which is blockchain and AI for climate change. So um, from 3 to 4 p.m., we are going to have uh, an introduction uh, from Inadva's Climate Action Working Group co-chairs. And then from 4 to 5 p.m., we will have a panel discussion on the same topic. With that, I would like to uh, now invite our two moderators for these two sessions. Firstly, Kiara Ke uh, Kealoha from IOV42, and then Bara Greplava from the Inadba Climate Action Working Group. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, good morning and good afternoon uh, to all of you, to our international audience, and uh, I hope you all are keeping well. Um, I will just give a very brief introduction. Um, I would like to welcome you to our panel on blockchain and AI for climate change. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers um, of the European Blockchain Week for giving us the space to bring this topic to you. Um, as, as was said, I am, uh, my name is Bara Greplova and I am your moderator for today together with Chiara. Uh, together, we are also the co-chairs of the Climate Action Working Group within the International Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications. Um, our aim for today, just did you know, is to um, showcase what is happening um, in the climate action space when it comes to utilization of um, emerging technologies, especially blockchain. Uh, so we have invited um, six experts um, from various fields, they are either directly or indirectly uh, related to climate change or climate action. Um, in the first hour, uh, as was said, uh, we will have presentations from them. Uh, and in the next hour, we will have a panel discussion with those presenters. Um, I would like to invite you to um, post any questions or comments you might have for our panelists uh, in the um, uh, if, if you in the chat box, uh, if that function is available to you, and we will be happy to answer the questions or the comments in the second hour. Um, at this point, uh, I would like to uh, welcome our keynote speaker, Mrs. Uh, Rosella Migliavaca from the Future Energy Foundation to um, kickstart the, uh, the event. Uh, Rosella, the floor is yours and welcome. Thank you and good afternoon. Thanks uh, for this invitation to talk here about climate change action. We will make uh, an overview. And uh, I have to say that's really the right place uh, to talk uh, about this overview. Why? Because uh, blockchain is a powerful tool that can really serve to improve uh, the transparency, accountability, traceability of greenhouse gas emission, and can serve also to support the companies to provide more accurate, reliable, standardized, and readily available data on carbon emission. This uh, here, the G20 and the COP26, uh, are really decisive moments uh, for the future of the humanity. Uh, recently was published the IPCC report and it show it's still possible to limit global temperature rise to 1.5. But we are already dangerously close to that threshold, the limit. We must by 2030 half emissions and reverse natural loss. What a challenge. How do we make the strides, the strides needed to limit the most catastrophic effect of climate change? And another important question, what system changes needed to be put in place and what has proven effective so far? Uh, we started talking about corporate climate action. Crucially, hundreds of global companies are already building the foundation of exemplary corporate climate action. And it's uh, the proof it's possible to get on track. 
just uh, as uh, the business world has done during the COVID-19 crisis, uh, these uh, companies are demonstrating business as an incredible ability to adapt and deliver rapid wide scale change. These companies are already making swift adjustment to ensure they continue to perform well and while aligning with this climate goal, tasking everyone, all the employee, and I mean from CEO to engineer to marketer, to develop and scale up the solution that will prevent temperature rise. This is uh, real progress. I'd like to mention two uh, good examples. The first one is a business ambition for 1.5 degrees campaign. The second one is a climate pledge. Uh, the first, business ambition for 1.5 degrees. It's uh, a huge campaign, uh, 700 businesses, employing 24 million people and representing 13 trillion dollars in market value. These companies are setting 1.5 degrees aligned science-based targets and are implementing plans to help half emission globally by 2030. Second example I would like to mention is a climate pledge. 110 plus companies are working together to help reach the goals of the Paris Agreement, but 10 years earlier. And time is crucial, you know that. Action taken by climate pledge include switching entire value chain to renewable power, making transport fleets all electric, innovating new lower carbon ways to manufacture products. Business ambition is uh, triggering marketing signal that drive governments and uh, financial institution to act finally. Around 70% of the global economy is now committed to net zero by 2050. A thought has many global superpowers adapt to stay aligned with the latest climate science we are increasingly seeing climate policy regulation enforced at the national level. US and EU, along with a growing list of over countries, will require that emissions are collectively reduced at least 50% by 2030 to stay on track for reaching net zero by mid-century. These uh, nationwide climate targets uh, provide uh, clarity on the long-term direction of the travel and to strengthen the case for countries to set clear end dates, I underline end dates, for coal and cars powered by petrol and diesel. European ministers are considering also a ban on all new combustion engine cars by 2035. The level of this voluntary corporate climate action so far proves that if government create the conditions for success, business will innovate and scale climate solution, I have to say many of which already exist. They must do it now because uh, companies have much to do to decarbonize, not just uh, their operation, but their value chains as well. Mainstream climate action, it's mandatory. Million of company, a huge number, need to get on track for half emission by 2030. That's the mantra. And to reach these goals, government need to play their part. 
Within the, the wide range of policies that governments needed to adopt, there are some, I think they are undisputable. The first one, ending coal, and the second, scaling up EVs and renewable power. Climate crisis is severe and demands a transformation of policy in every country and in every sector. Businesses uh, uh, urgently need a clear and consistent government policy aligned with uh, a 1.5 target to urge them to make investments and decision that will decarbonize the global economy. Third, governments should develop this policy in a closer dialogue with the, the corporate uh, uh, climate leaders because uh, they can really bring immense insight and innovation to the net zero transition. Uh, some uh, action uh, government can uh, take, uh, can uh, gear the market towards low carbon activities in uh, the pandemic recovery by stopping fossil fuel subsidies subsidies, putting a price uh, on carbon and uh, making climate related financial disclosure mandatory. To enable every country to take part uh, in uh, the transition, uh, welfare countries uh, need to deliver the expected $100 billion per year of climate finance uh, required for developing countries so they can be part of a race to reduce emission. Uh, I'm going to conclusion after all these uh, numbers and uh, uh, info. The science is alarming, but we can't let that overwhelm us. We need uh, brave and uh, collective action to half emission by 2030 and blockchain as a rule as well. By redefining the rules, governments can support businesses to do what they are best at and ensure that together we achieve this uh, monumental task. I was uh, just uh, today reading a, a quote from uh, uh, by McLuhan. He said, um, there are no passenger on a spaceship heard. We are all crew. And personally, I think uh, the part of the crew uh, called the blockchain as a, a very big task to do. Let's do it. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Rosella, and thank you for establishing the framework for our discussion and talk today. Thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, for this event. Um, I would like to now um, start the presentations and invite the first speaker, uh, Mr. Jörg Fiesler from the Climate Ledger Initiative uh, to tell us a little bit about uh, what they're doing with their organization. Jörg, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you, Bara, and um, I'd like to thank the organizers of the European Blockchain Week and in, in ARTPA to briefly share a few insights from our side from the Climate Ledger. In initiative, um, I will go into two uh, maybe a bit more co concrete use cases on how uh, blockchain can be used in climate action. And also I'd like to want to point uh, to the importance of governance as we go forward in, in these, these discussions. But first a word about uh, my organization, which is the Climate Ledger Initiative. Um, we uh, aim to accelerate the momentum for climate action under the Paris Agreement by fostering the use of emerging blockchain te technology and also other in innovative um, 
IT app, app applications, we have like three pillars. One is an analysis and, and research. Here the big question is, you know, where is the potential for this te technology? What's, what does make sense? What makes maybe less sense. Uh, we also have a number now like six, seven uh, concrete use cases where blockchain and other IT uh, ap applications are, are used in a co concrete setting, mostly also in de developing countries, because we think there the, the potential is, is really big for, for blockchain and these kind of trusted uh, uh, DLTs. And also we are a platform for exchange and joint learning. We are supported by Switzerland, Liechtenstein and the USA Climate Kick uh, institution, but work with the uh, UN FCCC, World Bank and other players. And we are run by my company, which is Infras and the gold standard, carbon standard. Now let's dive into the first uh, use case which we just um, um, finalized the co co cooperation uh, this spring. And um, this is the, the either risk use case. This is about um, using blockchain in Kenya, in Africa, where there are lots of farmers, uh, small holder farmers that um, suffer quite heavily from uh, weather. Uh, ex extremes and uh, climate change. And there the, the concept is that um, these farmers can buy through their simple uh, mobile phone, they can buy uh, ag agricultural in insurance for, for their crops. And then um, if the, the weather changes and there is a longer drought, for, for instance, then the satellite system de de detects this. Uh, um, uh, and um, at that point in time, then from the, the data that is on the blockchain ab about the different farmers policies, uh, once they experience crop uh, drought, uh, and loss in, in crop yield, then the system pays out each farmer um, as, as a certain payment, which then helps uh, to, to um, buy new seed, uh, seeds or also uh, re uh, replace the, the income that has been missed because of the ex extreme weather. So this is a simple system, but um, the, tr the blockchain here helps to have trusted data, it's rolled out uh, right now for 50,000 farmers and this summer the first farmers actually re received pay payment also through their mob mobile phones because a, a drought al already occurred. This is one concrete example on how to use blockchain. The second, this is more on a conceptual level, but you may have heard of the new Article 6 markets under the Paris Agreement. This is uh, the, the emission trading between different countries uh, from uh, concrete climate uh, mitigation projects, for instance, you build a, a, a wind farm in t t t Tunisia and then um, you, you sell the, the carbon credits. And also there, um, with the Paris Agreement, we have a less centralized system in internationally. Therefore, it's important to have a, a central registry, uh, which can be blockchain-based, where then different um, mitigation act, act activities um, that do their um, me measuring, reporting and uh, ver verification then can be uh, written into a, a blockchain based registry or we can have different registry systems that interact and have a certain level of interoperability. Also here, um, uh, Sweden is very interested in, in building such a system and we are helping them to find here a good and strong so solution. Now you see um, we have different uh, topics and, um, and a topic that keeps on um, emerging now during the, the three years we are working on, on this uh, blockchain field. This is the, the topic of uh, governance. So we try to use uh, um, blockchain to uh, uh, solve climate change issues. Um, but what is really important is that uh, 
we also have an overview of these different uh, governance issues. We did a report to, to, together. This was a collaboration between our climate ledger in initiative and in, in, in Atpa, uh, you see here on the top uh, Sven uh, and Anik from the Climate Ledger in, in initiative. We had Mar Mar Marianna from Geste Depot and also Jörn, um, who came from the side of the in, in, in Atpa, but also representatives of the use case we just saw from KFW and also from the World Bank working on these governance issues. Um, governance can be uh, sliced in different ways, but in the end, it's about power, risk, and res responsibilities, and how this is shared on, on different level. It's important to see that also with blockchain, also with a decentralized approach, you, you uh, need governance, you have to define this, and uh, it is essential to, to build trust and confidence in the te technology. In the re report, to, to, to briefly sum, summarize it, we look at uh, three levels of governance. First, on the international level, the level of the Paris ag Agreement, we have the, the, the different rules that are there for, for instance, for art, Article 6, for um, climate finance, also for the re reporting, which can be done through blockchain. Um, we have quite some rules on the national level, which is the, in, in the bottom in, in, in this slide. So you have to be com compliant with national, for instance, energy sector uh, re regulations uh, with your national um, climate policy rules, uh, in, 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 in environmental rules and so on. And uh, in the middle, you have also the, the blockchain level there on chain and off chain. Um, for, for, for instance, you need to clearly define who has which rights uh, to, to, to write or read uh, which data on, on your, your system. Um, you have different ways to, to, to structure your, your blockchain here, it, it's really important to have a, a good grasp of all these um, governance issues. And I would like to in, in invite you to uh, have a look at our um, blockchain for climate action and the governance challenge re report, this joint re report. You can download it from our website. And we have also a more general report, which is our annual flagship report. Navigating blockchain and climate action, which uh, you also can download there and where you can learn more about our different uh, use cases that we have in quite some countries. I close here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jörg, for, for the insight and for the use cases and for um, presenting what your company is doing. Uh, moving on, I would like to give the word to um, Anna Gorbacheva from the Global Observatory for Peer-to-Peer um, -peer Energy Trading um, to tell us a little more of what they are doing uh, in the space of energy. Anna, you can, uh, you can have the floor now. Everyone, thank you very much, Bara. Let me quickly share my screen. Uh, great, so hi everyone. Thanks a lot um, for having me here today. Uh, my name is Anna Gorbacheva and I'm a researcher at the University College in London. And I'm here today to present two of our projects. Um, one is the, um, the Global Observatory on Peer-to-Peer -peer Energy Trading, Collective Self-Consumption and Transactive Energy, in short, let's go peer-to-peer, -peer, and the Energy Trading Task Force, which we do together with ANADBA. So before I dive into the two projects, I want to quickly give you some insights on the background of um, our two projects. So as many of you might know, in the coming decades, the energy sectors globally are expected to go on undermined undergo a fundamental change. So we are moving away from the traditional energy system design where we have these large centralized generators that produce energy and the energy flows in a unidirected way to energy and consumers using the transmission and distribution grid. Um, and energy in this system were considered being these passive um, consumers whose load was relatively easy to predict. Um, and instead, uh, because of the decarbonization of our society as highlighted by the previous speakers, 
um, we're moving away from the centralized from these centralized generators to a more distributed electricity grid with also like bi-directional energy flows and increasing installation rates of distributed energy resources. And while this will help countries globally to meet the carbon reduction target, it will also um, contribute to increasing cost and grid reinforcement and balancing services because of the intermittent nature of uh, many of the distributed energy resources. So in search of a solution um, to these new challenges, the concept of local energy markets or de decentralized energy markets is receiving more and more attention, but it's still very early stage with a specific design configuration and operation of it not being um, fully explored. And since our market markets were designed, um, not accounting really for these new energy, um, small scale energy consumers, uh, there are no real incentives uh, for them to engage in, in the new markets, although it is necessary to guarantee stable grid operation. So um, the Global Observatory on Peer-to-Peer -peer Energy Trading is a technology collaboration program which runs under the International Energy Agency and is trying to find answers to exactly the, these challenges I just highlighted. Um, the goal of technology collaboration programs in general is to facilitate uh, global cooperation um, on energy technologies, and this is pretty much what we're doing at the observatory. We are the first international pre-competitive and early stage research collaboration, looking into the whole system implications of local energy models and provide more details. I'll provide more details on what the whole system specifically means in the next slide. Um, we have leading institutions involved, um, which look at these three types of models. I think we now have over 190 members from 22 countries. And the aim is really to collect valuable evidence on the factors determining the uptake of local energy models and their viability. And I think the unique approach of our observatory is that we try to get everyone to the table. We work with governments, businesses, NGOs, and research institutions. So why a whole system approach? Um, so for such a disruptive model to be introduced into the energy sector, it's important to, to essentially have everyone at the table and find a solution and communicate that solution. So our observatory is divided into five subtasks, trying to cover all of the relevant aspects necessary for the uptake of such models. And each subtask is led by one institution, which you can see here on the right of, of the slide. Some of the key deliverables of the observatory include subtask reports, um, I'll give some initial findings from this in the next slide. We will also produce country level reports on the key determining factors for the uptake of such models. And we will calculate readiness indices that will give us insights on the adoption of such models in the respective country. Right, let me switch to the next slide, there is. Um, so this slide briefly summarizes the initial findings from the subtask reports. Um, which say that local energy trading systems can be implemented in several ways and deliver many, many different environmental um, and societal benefits. Local energy trading sy systems can reduce good constraints and um, by aligning, for example, demand and supply and therefore help um, to transition to a net uh, zero future. But it is important that policymakers and regulators set clear outcomes and priorities to guide, to guide the design of the solutions. Um, uh, much of the operational factors of local energy systems are not yet fully answered. That includes, for example, grid constraints, forecasting uncertainty, communication, the involvement of human resources, billing and settlement, scalability, privacy, and especially the latter ones um, are challenges where blockchain could potentially provide a solution for. Um, the role of the participants uh, is also yet not properly defined. Are they uh, just energy end users or are they small businesses and also what happens to the traditional or new market um, entrant and market players who enter the market. Um, and then finally, the, we need to address the issues of privacy, interoperability, scalability and automation um, and find consensus also on the data processing formats. So as you can see, um, Many of the terms mentioned here also frequently appear in the DLT space. And while the uh, Global Observatory is a technology neutral organization, um, the decentralized character of distributed ledger technologies can help provide solutions to some of the challenges we see in this, in this area. Now let me uh, move to the next project we are involved in, 
Um, this is the Energy Trading Task Force, which is a collaboration between ANATPA and um, the Global Observatory. And the Energy Trading Task Force was brought to life essentially to answer some of the questions I just hi highlighted in my previous slides. And some of the key deliverables of the task force is to study and compare international pilot projects in the field of peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, transactive energy and community self-consumption, and also provide a forum to look into the development of new standardization recommendations and identify the challenges of these um, for the uptake of DLT solution in this space. So the technologies, um, some of our members work with are, I think Hyperledger, IOTA, we have the Energy Web Foundation, Ethereum, Hedera, and some others. So on these slides, I um, brought some of the initial findings from our interviews. So far, we've conducted um, four out of 10 pilot projects. We interviewed them and asked them some specific questions about how they use DLTs. So why using DLT? The answers usually included um, the automation of transaction, for example, by using smart contracts, uh, anonymity or protected identity, the traceability of information like the transactions load, but also the devices involved in the pilot project and privacy and security. Um, what functionalities are they used? Usually for registration and certification of load signals. Um, it is blockchain or DLT is used as an infrastructure, not as a currency. Um, they also have highlighted that a distributed system needs a distributed governance and management, therefore a blockchain is the ideal solution, and it's also recording mechanisms for the devices and transactions. We wanted to also know what standardizations our participants are involved in, and these were the three top mentioned. It's DLT for power, which is a Swiss standard developed, IEEE, and also uh, the ISO TC307. So another question included, um, what are the key challenges of standardization for DLT specifically in the sector of energy trading? And uh, answers included that there are no, there's no governing body for the industry. There's currently insufficient involvement and adoption. So there's no real incentive to take part. Um, standards and gen regulation general are often outdated or lag behind a couple of years of the current development. Um, blockchain is seen again, mainly as an enabling technology Therefore, standardization was assumed not to be really required in the space. Um, another uh, critical point was that standards are too hy hypothetical and too basic. So I assume that development is yet not as far as it should be. And there are also often the benefits aren't clear. Why should the company adapt to a standard if, if, if it's not necessary? And there's, of course, always the trade-off between regulation versus deregulation. And that's our last question. Um, we, are, uh, we also asked, which I'm presenting here today, uh, what are the key challenges when using DLT? Some were mentioning the cost of data storage, like how much can you actually store in the, uh, uh, in the blockchain? Is it all transactions or just the load? Um, the cost of transactions, there's also what's their worth, the energy, what is the worth of the transaction? Um, the immutability, again, that's technically benefit of the blockchain, but it could also be disadvantaged specifically in the energy sector when you have to adjust transactions or something changes in your load. Um, the negative reputation, specifically partners involved in pilot projects were critical about that and um, the usability of blockchain for end users because it's not as far developed yet as it's supposed to be and scalability. So these were some of the um, key findings mentioned uh, by our interviews. Um, how, you can, how can you get involved in either of the projects? Um, we're soon joining the data or starting the data collection phase. So you can join, for example, with your pilot project, assuming you meet the, the criteria. Um, you can also join Go P2P as a policymaker, business, NGO or researcher, or uh, join the energy trading task force if you're a member of Anatva or Go Peer to Peer. So for, um, for information how to join, I have provided here information from my colleague, Alexandra Schneiders. And yeah, thank you very much for, the, for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to, to reach out. Thank you so much, Anna, for the overview and for presenting what your organization is doing. Uh, I would like to move on uh, to our next next uh, guest speaker, uh, Mr. Carl Schultz from the Adaptation Leisure. Um, Carl, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here Thank with us. Thank you very much. Um, um, and thanks, thanks for the organizers of this uh, conference and, and for, for Bara and Chiara for asking me to, to join. Um, today, I'm going to speak about um, 
a subject that um, is, is, isn't is really discussed very much within uh, blockchain and AI communities, certainly not within blockchain communities. But I'm going to focus on the subject area and the challenge much more so than the solutions, because there are relatively few solutions that have been uh, presented to deal with climate adaptation, adapting to climate change. But let's, let's, let's put this a, a little bit in context here. I think we're all aware of what's going on around the world. And I'm not talking policies, I'm not talking COVID. What I'm talking about is um, just a plague, literally a plague in some instances, but also a plague of severe weather events that has had devastating implications on economies, on uh, comfort, on health, um, and certainly also on, uh, on lives. And so I'm talking about here is how climate change is really causing risks and pressures as the World Bank's adaptation pr principles notes. That's really forcing us, I really hope it's forcing us to rethink how we're prioritizing what we're doing, how we're allocating resources, and how we're really engaging on governance um, of our natural systems and our economy. Um, I noted that there's really two sides to climate change. There's mitigation, which is what most people think of when they're thinking about climate change, and that is reducing emissions, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, that is, and also thereby reducing global heating and the corresponding effects. But the effects are really what adaptation addresses directly. Um, there's climate change, even with a 1.5 degree warming target, there's going to be increasing impacts on global systems. What adaptation does is it tries to allow for these systems to adjust or just get out of the way. It works on both human systems through uh, infrastructure investments, through migration, both within countries and between countries. And we're seeing a lot of this adaptation occurring in Europe and in North America and elsewhere. Um, but it also works to strengthen and restore natural systems so that it protects both the natural systems but also aids the um, human systems. So where does adaptation happen? It happens everywhere. Some of the key um, elements and issues, we've already raised energy from the perspective of emissions controls, uh, but energy is also one of the most vulnerable systems to the impacts. If you look at drilling rigs, if you look at wind farms, if you look at all of these infrastructure, if you look at mining, they're all very vulnerable and face considerable risks to their operations and to their, their profitability. Coastal areas, we all know, are very, very exposed. Uh, human health systems are exposed. Uh, there are many discussions now with COVID over how, um, how health systems are affected, but that could be actually one of the most significant ones. And this doesn't just look at how malaria is moving in different areas. It's looking at how heat is killing people and reducing productivity. Um, infrastructure, of course, is relevant, as is tourism. And you'll see that uh, skiing operations around the world are having to adjust, um, but sometimes they're not succeeding at that. Agriculture and forestry food systems are highly vulnerable. We've raised the issue of supply chain. Agriculture in our current global economy is highly interdependent on different uh, regions and what they can grow. And we are facing an issue right now where currently a number of different staple crops are threatened in terms of their productivity in the places where they're currently being grown and the ways they're grown. And this will have severe implications on human health, on uh, nutrition, and on the ability for people to get enough calories to uh, thrive. Now, there's a lot of different ways that one can adapt. One can be reactive, one can flee, but generally speaking, 
there's a variety of different approaches from ecosystem-based adapt adaptations, and this could be um, encouraging mangrove um, growth around coastal areas to protect against uh, storm surges, uh, severe weather uh, from tropical storms. It could be looking at how you have hybrid options where, for instance, parks are made more flood resistant through a combination of natural systems. Also, we should see parks and a reduction of impermeable pavement in our cities as being very important to reduce flood risks that we've seen uh, all throughout Europe, but in particular in Northwest Europe, a lot of challenges over just the last couple of months. There are, of course, and this is what people oftentimes think of first, infrastructure-based options. These are dams, dikes, berms, and seawalls when we're dealing with uh, flooding and coastal issues. But then we should also be thinking about political and social options. And this includes better planning. Uh, it looks at developing better early warning systems. And the example that Jörg gave of uh, blockchain-based weather insurance is an option that also is really considering how social and economic systems can play an important role in helping it adapt. So um, why should we do it? Well, we should do it because it's essential for the well-being and the livelihoods and the lives of all sorts of people, but it's also a good investment. And so here are just some benefit cost ratios for a variety of different um, systems that could be adapted. But you'll perhaps note that based on making new infrastructure resilient, we could see net benefits of 4 trillion. There are lots of challenges. You have problems right now where um, the investments in adaptation far lag mitigation. A big challenge there is that integration is lacking and there's a lot of opportunities for us to come up with solutions that address the problems that carbon markets may have faced uh, and governance faced in the mitigation space that should be applied. Here are some of the systems that really overlap. I'm not gonna dwell on these because I have limited time, but if you look at it, we are dealing with both adaptation frameworks that maybe need to be um, working with climate services, climate actions, but also digital and governance innovations. And this is where, of course, blockchain arises, but also instruments to help uh, quantify the adaptation benefits are important. And um, speaking, speaking as adaptation ledger, uh, we feel that an integrated platform system is really needed to overcome these challenges. Here's what we're proposing is that you, we combine a variety of different digital technologies with governance, um, with also, of course, know-how uh, to come up with a, a, a broad general system that can be used for, therefore, applying specific applications to address a whole variety of different partner and customer needs, everything from uh, scaling up pilot projects, monitoring, evaluation, trading, finance, and of course, policy and regulatory issues. This sort of platform we propose will provide not just incremental improvements to the adaptation space and solutions that are required for us to survive as a global commons, but should allow for some transformational changes at the system level that I think are very important. We need to make urgent and, and massive investments in adaptation soon, or we're gonna face many more lives lost and disruptions to global economy. And these systems that we're talking about really need to be bolstered. We need to do this by advancing digital solutions. And I think blockchain is one of the most important ones for ensuring data integrity, environmental integrity, transparency, and also tracking and allowing for value transfer. So just to conclude, um, there are relatively few applications out there that are specific to adaptation. Uh, we have one called Well-Adapted Coffee Supply, which um, tries to integrate uh, remote sensing, uh, internet of things, to convey value up and down all the way from the farm level to the coffee consumer. 
this will allow for everyone, including the consumer, to know that uh, uh, small scale farmers are being provided with resources and maintenance to maintain their, um, maintain their coffee growing, which makes it more sustainable. But it also ensures that all the way along the chain, businesses will have greater assurance that they'll uh, have security of supply and uh, that um, information is being conveyed in a way so that the security of supply and the adaptation continues to be sustained as rewards and needs are matched up more effectively. With that, I'd just like to thank you all um, and hope that this was of some interest to you and, and hope that we have an opportunity to uh, engage and potentially work together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol, and thank you for presenting this topic on adaptation. And as you said, it's a um, topic that's not always uh, discussed or it's not always uh, on, the, uh, on the agenda. So thank you for being here and uh, participating in the discussion. Uh, later today. Um, moving on, I would like to welcome uh, Alexei Shadrin uh, from a company called Eversity uh, to give us a presentation on uh, his organization. Alexei, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you today. So uh, my name is Alexei. Um, I'm also um, the leader of the finance working group in the climate chain coalition and um, i'm here to present our company ever ct platform that is a sustainability measurement and investment platform and also i will say a few words about the green finance space and how it is developing in europe and elsewhere so um I founded Eversity with my co-founder, Lisa. We have been working 10 years together in the impact finance space. We have been running a climate fund and uh, done a lot of sustainability consulting services. Uh, at some point after visiting the Paris Climate uh, Conference, we realized we need to focus more on the technologies and the finance side to combat climate change. And this is when we started to look at blockchain. Uh, we also started to invest some angel you know, money to companies that introduce various technologies such as blockchain for the climate finance market. And uh, it was relatively successful because in 2017, one of these teams pioneered the world's first carbon credit transaction on the blockchain, which was uh, widely acknowledged by the UN, by the World Bank. And this is where our innovation journey started. We went to um, uh, Bonn uh, to the UN Climate Conference. There we met a lot of new friends and formed the Climate Chain Coalition, which is now uh, a global association of more than 260 members, officially supported by the UNFCCC, and which is also an ANADBA member. So um, we've been doing a lot of experiments around blockchain and various monitoring tools like sensors, satellites, and drones, bridging them with blockchain, trying to solve uh, some market problems and to realize how to commercialize these technologies. So uh, what we literally found out during these years is that uh, we can solve two major problems. First, uh, sustainable finance is really complicated. It's something on top of the current financial system. It uh, deals a lot with additional documentation, additional criteria, standards, and uh, it's really hard to issue a regular bond for a smaller company. Um, and it's even harder to issue a green bond, for example, because you have to do a lot of more stuff around it. You have to hire consultants and pay them a lot. So um, sustainable finance is not really uh, so simple. It's not really accessible for SMEs in developing countries. And on the other hand, uh, the investors who invest in green bonds and invest in more broader you know, impact and sustainable projects, uh, they have the problems with trust between you know, investors and projects. Um, problems to establish this trust because sometimes the investees are located like thousands of kilometers away from the office of the investor. And also there are problems of impact measurement and reporting because still on this market, we've talked to many people, many development agencies, commercial banks, 
in Europe, most of them still measure the impact using you know, Excel spreadsheets or just sending emails around the impact of, of the investment. So this is not really um, trustworthy and is not really transparent and traceable. So uh, this is why we came up uh, with an idea to create a blockchain-based platform that would help institutional impact investors and uh, SMEs um, increase transparency of the impact measurement, increase its traceability, and at the same time automate a lot of processes related to green finance market, simplify them and make them more efficient and also more, more cost efficient. So uh, our platform covers three main steps of this journey, starting from uh, the structuring of some investment, for example, a green bond, uh, and also screening the portfolio against uh, well-known standards like the EU taxonomy to understand what is eligible to issue a green bond and what is not, and then creating a, uh, a green bond framework to describe the issuance. Then on the second stage, we have designed a special uh, open source blockchain protocol that allows to issue green bonds uh, in the form of digital assets. And also some other assets as well can be uh, issued using our open source protocol. This is very important uh, thing uh, because we think that, you know, all these technologies, blockchain technology should, should be mainly open source to serve as a global common good and uh, market standard. So we're working on in this direction. And the third stage is the monitoring of uh, those assets um, in relation to the framework and those commitments that the issuers made. So by plugging in those third party monitoring tools, we can collect the impact data, then refine this data in accordance with the framework uh, of the green bonds, which was uh, issued and verified um, aligning with global standards like climate bond standard or some other standards, and then use this data to establish semi-automated reporting, thus making this whole process really easier and faster. So um, uh, the sustainable finance protocol that we've uh, developed is available on GitHub. It is an open source software. We encourage more people to use it. So for example, it also allows to connect the interest rate of a bond to the impact measurement from the project side. And um, the interest rate would recalculate automatically and change according to the performance of the issuer. So for example, if the issuer um, delivers on his commitments, then the interest rate can step up. If he does not uh, deliver, uh, sorry, if he does not deliver, the interest rate can step up. If he delivers more than expected, it can step down. It can send the same. So there are various um, actually ways to program the interest rate and blockchain really helps us to develop those new types of sustainable finance instruments. And we strongly believe that new types of these instruments can originate in the future years because for example, uh, if we're talking about a bond, the interest rate is being recalculated usually once a year. Uh, with this software, we can launch digitally such a bond where the interest rate will re be recalculated each day, depending on the impact from a renewable power plant, for example, on the energy output. So I'm not saying this is the ultimate goal of our <laughs> project here, but I'm saying that there are lots of options how you can program your bonds, how you can establish the linkage of the interest rate uh, to various impacts uh, and, it, and their measurements. So it's a whole new universe uh, of programmable and fully transferable, uh, transparent and traceable uh, bonds. So we are just starting to discover uh, this thing. So we, present, uh, we will present the product at the United Nations conference this year. We want to issue um, digital green bonds with uh, the leaders from the banking sector. And then we plan to make the platform more open to SMEs that would use it to raise uh, investment in the form of green bonds and also open to retail investors that could invest and participate in the green uh, transformation. Lately, we have some plans to introduce AI to analyze the sources of data and uh, this is something that we plan for the future. So now just a few words around the current situation with uh, blockchain-based bonds. So uh, recent, uh, you know, in previous years, 
the situation was that uh, banks made their first pilots within their closed uh, ecosystem and boundary. Now, uh, this year, we have witnessed a new uh, stage of the market, and we can see that lots of banks around the globe, including the European Investment Bank, which is leading in this space, uh, they are issuing real blockchain bonds with real participants, real investors, real custodians, real uh, um, you know, arrangers of the issue. So every participant of the bond issue uh, is doing something on the blockchain. And this is what we're seeing right now. And the volumes of those issuances, they're not quite low, but they're not quite big. So they're getting bigger uh, year by year, and we can see the adoption. And uh, we've talked to many banks around the globe and also mainly European banks. And what they consider is that uh, the bond market uh, will be blockchainized or transformed to blockchain the first. So they're getting ready to provide uh, the products to their customers related to blockchain-based bonds. And uh, since they are already doing this, the next uh, stage would be uh, issuing a green bond on the blockchain. We've seen an HSBC report, uh, which sheds a lot of lights, uh, light on the benefits of blockchain for the green bond market. We've seen a lot of quotes from BBVA and other banks. But uh, what we also see right now, and some members of the Climate Change Coalition and the UN are working together with the BIS, uh, who is now uh, announcing the partnership with the Hong Kong Stock Exchange to look at the issuance of blockchain-based bonds and their monitoring using the blockchain. So, but no one has issued a blockchain-based green bond so far. And uh, we also hope to be among the leaders who will do this uh, uh, first with some uh, you know, banking partner. So now few words around uh, benefits of blockchain on each step of the green or sustainability bond life cycle. So first, um, it's a very actual topic in the European Union, everything related to EU taxonomy reporting and screening. Everyone has to do it uh, from the 1st of January next year, and there will be more and more requirements. So um, automation and IT technologies really can help to screen uh, you know, portfolios and um, uh, reveal what is eleg eligible, what is aligned according to the taxonomy. But uh, if we're talking about bonds and green finance, um, this screening can help to understand what, is, what assets are eligible uh, to be financed using green bonds. And once we have this report done, uh, we can upload it to the blockchain and the auditor, for example, can verify the EU taxonomy report on the blockchain to ensure the data immutability and transparency of this data. But it's important to say that some data could be sensitive. So blockchain can be used uh, not only to expose the whole data, but just to verify the hash of the report and verify that somewhere the report is being kept and it is not changed and the you know financial figures could be kept uh, in a private loop while this verification can be made on the public blockchain then uh, the structuring and labeling parts so here um, automated document creation makes a lot of sense and this is what we're doing using our platform um, after the framework has been created and finalized. Again, it can be verified by the auditor on the blockchain and it can be stored on the blockchain by the issuer, again, to uh, provide transparency uh, and data immutability. This is how Green Asset Wallet and Inter-American Development Bank platform is now working and gaining a lot of traction, interest by BlackRock and its portfolio companies and uh, the green transparency platform by IADB gains a lot of traction among um, American, South American banks. So also uh, the framework can be used to configure uh, the future parameters of the bond. Uh, then the booking and uh, the issuance part. So um, this part is really heavily affected by blockchain because a lot of stuff here can be automated by the sequence of smart contracts. So literally, we are creating an um, automated machine, uh, which represents the bond and its process. 
and various stakeholders just need to upload various data into this machine to proceed to the next stage of the bond uh, booking or issuance. So this is in simple words how this is made. Uh, the machine is created, is configured by the arranger and the issuer, and then it just needs various data inputs and actions, signatures by various stakeholders like investors, verifiers, and other guys uh, to proceed, you know, and to fulfill next steps um, until the issuance. So it really shortens the bond issuance time because of the automation. It's a broader success and uh, makes it possible for various groups of investors to participate. And also it reduces intermediaries because, for example, we can automate the interest rate calculation. And uh, upon receipt of the input data from a sensor or the satellite, and upon the verification of such a data, the interest rate in our bond machine will be calculated in a fully automatic mode. And every stakeholder will, will receive the information on how this interest rate was calculated, what data was used to calculate this interest rate, who verified this data, and who sent this data for verification. So literally creating the traceable um, you know, steps that we can check as investors, for example, and that creates a golden source of truth for every bond stakeholder. So this benefit was underlined by the European Investment Bank within their uh, 100 million euros bond issuance. And uh, for green and sustainability linked bonds, this is much uh, more uh, important case than for vanilla bonds uh, within the EIB issuance. Also, uh, what the, our UN friends think that blockchain here can uh, attribute the impact to various investors on various stages. So for example, there were early investors, then after the project was built, there was another investor. And also there was some investor or trader that bought uh, the bonds on the secondary market. So how do we attribute the impact of the project to these investors? We need to calculate their uh, you know, um, financial contribution to the project and attribute the impact depending on their contributions. So this is exactly what blockchain can do because in this virtual machine, you can see each uh, contribution in terms of finance. And once the impact is being generated, it can be attributed automatically to all the investors. Also, we can connect carbon credits to green bonds to make an additional incentive to, to green bonds investors. And this is something what we're working on in the later stages of our blockchain protocol. Needed to mention that European Union is planning to introduce a central bank digital currency, which makes a lot of sense. And it's absolutely the right step for the, uh, the block. And uh, once this will be introduced, all those blockchain uh, features and uh, applications for green finance will grow significantly because uh, when this will be introduced, there will be more transparency and security in the financial layer. And once it's there, then all other layers will be synergetically activated and there will be a huge boom of all the startups and the ecosystem. Uh, the financial ecosystem will largely transform into the digital realm. So uh, we've also prepared uh, some reports that you can check out uh, using this QR code. It's a digital SDG finance bulletin. And we're now working on the third version. Uh, hopefully we can uh, also partner with Inatba here and other partners. Um, so you can learn those key outcomes that we spoke about uh, today in this report. Also read some interviews and also have an overview of the use cases by the Climate Change Coalition members. Uh, with this, I'm really thankful for your attention. We'll be happy to answer your questions offline, and I can send the link to the report in the chat window. Thanks, everyone, and thanks uh, also the organizers uh, for the leadership and great organization. Thank you so much. Uh -huh.
Thank you so much, Alexei. Uh, and please do share the link to the report uh, in the chat box. Uh, at this time, we are running over time, I'm aware, but we think still it's important for you to hear uh, the presenters present their companies and their use cases. So we will shorten the discussion after this. Uh, but just to repeat, please post any questions or comments you might have in the chat box if you have that function available. And uh, moving on to uh, our next speaker, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Gianfranco Campos from the company uh, Zignar Technologies. Um, Gianfranco, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, amazing to be here, and also great to have this type of conversations. Uh, as you said, uh, I'm Gianfranco Campos. I represent Zignar Technologies, and uh, today we're going to talk about uh, climate change and how this relates to our flagship project which is interplanetary precision agriculture. So I would like to start first with the elephant in the room, which is uh, climate change. So it is becoming increasingly obvious that the climate crisis is affecting not only isolated communities, but also the entire world. The climate crisis directly impacts water and temperature cycles and has triggered a human migration crisis involving communities in every corner of the globe. Um, a significant number of coastal cities in North America and the world will disappear in the next 30 years or less, which is a massive, hard to slow down problem. In my opinion, uh, building resilient infrastructure that empowers local communities and regional economies to produce what they need to survive is, and thrive is a key. Um, having a DLT available in every corner of the globe will allow humanity to maximize efficiency in available resources, reduce mar marginal cost of production, and connect communities previously segregated from the worldwide economy. Um, also, by introducing this trust layer available in omnipresent manner, every community becomes an actor in the evolving economy, opening up revenue streams that were previously inaccessible to them. Um, so, Specifically, we are working on uh, greenhouse farming, and that this is because we see the shift and the, the, the impact on, on the climate changes to uh, outdoor farming. So uh, we think that this will allow continuity for local production. Then regarding uh, greenhouse farming, we identified that the farmers in general, not only for greenhouse, but in general, they feel stressed when they try to deal with dozens and dozens of variables. Uh, because they have a complex relationship and uh, also because there is lots of data silos through the production process. And then on top of that, uh, when they make a change, the effects become evident months down the road uh, after they make the change. So the precision agriculture industry is, uh, is striving, is growing really, really fast. It's going to move from 7 billion to 12.8 billion in the next five years. Uh, most of the uh, attention or most of the, the share is going to happen in North America, but also lots of action in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, there is a huge opportunity in, in the tech or precision agriculture industry. And uh, we started with uh, these two crops grapes and tomatoes um, because uh, the market is driven by them. But the same technology is actually being applied for other crops such as basil. And uh, we are uh, eagerly developing more. Uh, uh, we are developing the technology further to allow more crops as we grow. So what it or how do we uh, solve this problem? Well, on the left side, we have the real world. On the, then we have data collectors, IoT devices. These data collectors, IoT devices are sending data to our backend and then uh, presenting this data and allowing the farmer to control this data uh, directly from, from their mobile access. That's the, the light version. Um, and then the full version of it is, uh, well, we have um, a water quality measurement uh, IoT device. We have a um, habitat IoT device that we have developed for this purpose uh, and a scale, a commercial scale that is integrated with uh, this platform and also a rover that uh, allows to capture the behavior of the crops. So the first two devices will give us the input variables and the second two devices will give or giving, gives us the, the output variables uh, of the greenhouse. 
then the IoT data is contextualized through our farm management system, where the farmer is capable of adding, um, uh, for example, the seed management or the crop planning or the plot, uh, well, the, the, the sections management as well within the farm. So this is the business layer that adds logic to the IoT data. And at the same time, all of this data is being sent to uh, IORA Tango, uh, where it becomes mutable. And as we are sending data every 15 minutes, uh, we require a fillless layer. Because one of the issues that we found with blockchain, and I'll mention that later on, is that since you have fees, uh, it creates uh, friction on the communication. So uh, we bet more on the DLT industry uh, that uh, it includes different data structures and uh, IORA is uh, fitting that purpose very, very great. Uh, then we have the certainty that the data hasn't changed or hasn't damper, and we connect uh, our machine learning models to read from this data and improve or yeah, improve the process of production by identifying the optimal growing conditions and also uh, presenting this data, the, the backend presents this data to the farmer then uh, the farmer adds again the logic of the business and it's a feedback loop that it's created. You see there Mars Farmer and Earth Farmer because there is a potential use case that we are developing that allows, this, uh, that allows the farmer to sell the optimal growing conditions. So a farmer that creates this uh, data um, is not only capable of uh, improving their own operation but also collaborating or selling these uh, reports to other farmers. So what you see there on the left side button is our first uh, uh, MVP for the IoT device that is part of the platform. Then on the top side on the left is the farm management system where the farmer adds the logic to, um, to their own operation. And then on the top right side is the computer vision that uh, it's uh, mounted on the rover um, that serves the farm. We are exploring uh, three options right now for uh, mostly focus on greenhouse farm, farming, but also extendable to outdoor farming. Um, specifically for the computer vision, uh, we have developed a rover. Now we are uh, developing a rail system that it's gonna be modularized. So uh, farmers can have uh, the camera running um, within the greenhouse in a 3D printer fashion. And then the, the third option is the rover. But the, the key component that is present in these three uh, types is essentially the computer vision. So um, let me show you the data structure that we use. And uh, this speaks more about the DLT industry than, um, than blockchain. So since blockchain was the first type of distributed ledger technology or DLT available, it definitely has become a sort of a trademark for the industry. But it is important to differentiate both concepts. And why is this differentiation uh, necessary? Uh, as an example, uh, Bitcoin, uh, a Bitcoin transaction uses, um, obviously, or Bitcoin uses blockchain as data structure. However, one, one Bitcoin transaction consumes the same amount of energy as an average household in US would consume in 60 days. That's unsustainable. And having that blockchain per se might have certain specific characteristics that make it attractive only in some use cases. Um, well, this is the reason why in Signal Technologies, we prefer to refer to the DLT industry uh, as a more general term, and not only to be specific about the nomenclature, but also as a way to impose a more nuanced discussion that takes into account use cases um, we surmise that it is imperative to adopt this type of nuanced discussions in order to address hype and impracticability. Uh, in general, uh, DLT is a trust machine that allows everybody to agree on the data that is written in the ledger. Um, agreement and veracity of data is not only a way to build the new emerging economy, but also a desirable strategy that can be applied to all industries regarding climate action this omnipresent trust machine can be used to propose new business models that are yet to be discovered. One business model that are, we are very passionate about, and, and I mentioned it before, is to check the footprint, or, or sorry, is to check the sensor data about the human activities. So 
uh, that data, when once written on the tangle, it becomes immutable. And definitely the, uh, the parties can have certainty about what has been written there. So we can trust the sensor data. Then uh, regulators, communities, customers can take action depending on if it was good or not. Um, so uh, to achieve this, we have decided to implement our solutions with IOTA because using the technology, we can send 600 billion messages or transactions with the same energy required to process one Bitcoin transaction. And on top of that, at zero fees. So um, let's uh, go here. What are the biggest concerns about data? Well, the scope of these questions relates to a very well-known concept, which is GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. Data analysis, uh, information prediction, and AI models require data quality to produce desirable outcomes. Therefore, we require certainty about the data to rely on the outcomes. As mentioned before, um, these trust machines allow users and companies to base their business models on reliable ledgers, in other words, a single source of truth. As an example of these emerging technologies, uh, for example, Project Alvarium, uh, proposed by main industry players like Intel, Dell, Linux Foundation, and the IORA Foundation, is defining data confidence fabrics for edge devices. This is a very significant development because in the future, um, users will have means to differentiate simulated data from real data. It is a sad state of affairs to know that a good percentage of customers and partners have accepted today's limitations about data quality and data privacy and accept them as a necessary evil. So part of our effort includes spreading the good news that data is the new oil and arguably better Therefore, if they are already producing the data, why not profit from it? That's the key message that we are spreading. So what is the value proposition of our solution? Uh, maximize yield by identifying optimal growing conditions and automating the task. That's the, the key focus of uh, our proposal. Uh, we are distributed in seven countries, um, Canada, US, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, and Chile. Um, the team is, uh, have, uh, I would say, uh, it has some multi, multi skills uh, from data science, electronic engineers, uh, software engineers. And what you see at the bottom are the uh, places that we have studied at or that we have worked for. Um, our competitors, we found that there are uh, big players in the same industry that are focusing on uh, these type of solutions and actually makes us excited. Um, but we also identify that they are moving slowly towards the DLT adoption. Um, so it also represents an opportunity for startups that, like ours. Uh, the timeline for our project, well, right now um, we are under the commercialization for Alberta, uh, the Alberta greenhouse markets uh, with expansion next year for the Canadian greenhouse markets and then further expansion to North America. We are already talking to uh, European farmers as well to develop projects uh, with them. So uh, we are not necessarily following this timeline to get there, uh, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the opportunity. Then um, just to close and wrap up very quickly on these concepts, what you see here is what I talked before. We have IoT devices sending data to the Tangle and also uh, AI creating knowledge based on this data. So the farmer is capable of uh, commercializing this knowledge uh, or these optimal growing conditions with other farmers, with the space settlements or with uh, wholesalers. And that's thanks to uh, the zero fees of the network we use. Also, uh, this use case that Actually, it's a, a bigger use case for the machine economy um, in where the farmer not necessarily has to own or go through the a capital expense, but it can go a paper in a paper use model, uh, paying for the specific uh, features that they need uh, from our software platform, from machines, or from um, the AI uh, part of the solution. So this allows other farmers, uh, software manufacturers to get involved 
and uh, offer solutions that maximize the use of resources, reduce the carbon footprint, uh, because you don't have to build a new device to serve someone else, but reuse a device that is not uh, being uh, in operation at the moment that you need it. So that means that, uh, let's say there is a, a, a rover or there is a farm machine that it's uh, in the same region that is owned by another farmer. So you can rent that machine and that machine could uh, be delivered or uh, service to you through a machine to machine transaction. And the owner of the machine won't even know that the transaction happened uh, at the moment that it happened, maybe months later or, or uh, at the end of the month. Um, so that's the machine economy and that's the huge potential of these technologies. And the third use case that we are uh, developing for is a decentralized exchange of futures market. So we have with the IoT data and the AI data, certainty about the quality, the quantity and timing of production. Then uh, this is the key uh, type of information that SMEs farmers require to enter a futures contract because right now they don't have a way to support their own operation or to, um, to argument that they are doing the right things at the right time. So with this type of data uh, being written on the uh, Ayura network, they have a way to certify their production, certify their stock, then um, they can get investment from uh, farmers around the world or traders essentially that are looking for um, this type of, of opportunities. So um, yeah, those are the, the key use cases that we are uh, working on right now. And um, thank you very much. Uh, this is our contact information and feel free to reach out if you have any question. Amazing. Thank you so much, Gianfranco, for, for the presentation and for introducing your use cases in your company to us. Um, I would like to move on to our last presenter, uh, since we are a little bit uh, behind of time. So um, uh, I would like to give the floor to Veronica Garcia from BitLumens. And um, welcome, Veronica. And uh, we're happy to hear your uh, thoughts and the presentation on your company. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I will be uh, fairly brief. Um, as uh, mentioned before, so I'm the CEO of, of BitLumens. Uh, we are currently working with mainly sensors, LoRa network, and the blockchain. Um, so what we basically do is um, we bring a, a smart meter, a single phase smart meter into rural communities. Okay, we have seen that, for instance, energy providers in rural communities, uh, so could be PV mini grids, lack of renewable um, uh, energy data in, in those communities. Uh, it's extremely, extremely difficult to transmit uh, data because of sometimes the lack of, of internet. Um, and then the grids usually also lack of uh, this remote monitoring that allow to reduce O&M costs. Um, so then on top of it, um, usually these mini grids do not know how much are users actually spending on their electricity bills because wherever there is no power grid or the uh, electricity access is intermittent uh, and you don't have any sort of uh, automated um, uh, data connection, you know, it's extremely difficult to get access to all of this. And as a result, you see, you know, still access to kerosene wood and candles in those rural communities uh, with lower productivity unfortunately and there is of course blackout tampering whenever it's intermittent and uh, and they usually don't have access to financial services and if they do the interest rates are extremely high um, on top of this um, you know there are health risks associated with uh, co2 emissions in this in these communities so the combination we have done is basically, we created our smart meter. Um, uh, it's a very, very simple meter that it's connected to a mesh network and later on to the chain. 
where we have an algorithm running for two different purposes. Uh, one of them is to provide the, the PV mini grid um, with a carbon credit or a renewable energy certificate, uh, depending on the type of generation uh, they have. Um, and the second one is to provide the end user with, um, let's call it a credit score. It's a scoring system that will allow them to get access to investors in case uh, they need, for instance, a, a microloan uh, to increase their productivity. Um, so we mainly focus, I would say, in uh, mitigation. Uh, we put uh, these two uh, parameters on the chain. Uh, it's the end value, it's not raw data. Um, and then we link it to the smart metering devices that are also linked to a very specific location. So in areas where these users don't have a smartphone, they still have access to a smart meter, uh, which somehow will connect them to a particular KYC or Know Your Customer, um, allowing them to have financial access um, and uh, be able to do demand management because through the smart meter, since it's pay as you go, uh, what we do is we can lock and unlock the system remotely depending on uh, whether the user has paid. Uh, for instance, um, if the user does not pay, then the system is locked. Um, and this also allows us to create uh, a profile uh, on, 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 on each of these transactions and understand what is the carbon mitigation in those communities. Um, we, are, we are doing this in, I would say, a unique way. Um, so the, the, the most important piece in the, in the whole puzzle of, of technologies that we are currently using, I think it's, it's LoRa Network. Uh, that really allow us to send data in those remote communities. Um, so that's, that's a really important uh, piece that I want to highlight. And then of course, uh, the blockchain. So I would say IoT, the, the LoRa network, that it's a mesh basically, and the chain are the three most important technologies that we are currently using uh, to do demand forecasting, energy planning, which is very, challenging to do since most of these communities don't have access to, to data. Uh, and then, you know, arriving with solar panels, a storage system, and not knowing how much uh, these communities are going to consume is, is quite difficult. Um, and on top of that, building on some sort of uh, credit scoring system for these communities, mainly farming communities, um, to get access to, to the credit they need. And uh, one of the reasons we started to do this is because we see that there are any way between 3.5 trillion to 6 trillion worth of investments that are going to be needed per year to achieve the goals on the, on the Paris Agreement. Um, and so the, the transition risks, I think, are, are also huge, right? If, if you have those amounts. And I just don't see how the public sector is going to get to those sums uh, only with, with the fiscal spending available they have. So of course, private players have to get in. And uh, one of the most important pieces that we are really trying to address in each of these, um, I would say equation uh, parts is uh, regulation. Right, so you have um, the regulatory system for the financial part, so financial inclusion. Then you have different sets of regulations for the smart meter, different set of data regulation for the data packages you send. Um, and then last but not least on, on the chain itself. So it's, um, I would say it's, it's quite challenging to put all of it together, but uh, right now we are, our main market is um, India and a few uh, countries in, in uh, Latin America, like we are focusing in Mexico, Colombia and Bolivia, uh, where we are uh, trying to apply some, some deploy, sorry, some pilots. Um, 
and uh, and I think the the way moving forward will really be you know how we can create a use case where we bring investors into into those communities. So I was uh, very very happy to hear the, the the different presentations on on the different uh, technologies that have been adopted so far to really have a, a common goal, which is the reduction of uh, of the temperatures uh, worldwide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica, and thank you for uh, you know thank you to all the speakers for uh, presentations on the various um, sectors they work uh, in. Uh, since we are running uh, out of time, we will not take any break, uh, and uh, I would just like to um, give uh, give the uh, floor to my uh, colleague Kiara, who will now lead the discussion. Great, thank you so much, Bara, and thank you again to um, our keynote speaker and all of our panelists. Um, as Bara said, we are running a little bit behind, but I think that's okay because it was excellent to hear all of the dis different presentations um, from our panelists. And also, I think this really underscores the ubiquitous need for climate action and also highlights the, the diverse nature of climate innovation. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hop into the panel discussion. Uh, just a word to our esteemed panelists. If you can try to keep your responses to around two minutes or so, that would be great, just so that I can kind of give a chance for everybody to respond. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to open up with a kind of open-ended question. Um, and that is, uh, directed to all of the panelists, um, but what are the biggest concerns uh, and or requests from the people you're speaking with, whether that's clients or partners, and how does DLT uh, or AI um, address these concerns or requests? I will hand it over first to Jörg. Thank you, and I think that's quite a, an, an, an open question, of course, but maybe looking a bit back the last three, four years where, where um, blockchain really had a, quite a, a, a boom as a, as a topic, and now um, I think we are much more sober now, and um, the solutions that we saw to, to, to today are also much more advanced than what we saw earlier, and I think um, Doing climate action, doing uh, re re reducing greenhouse gases um, in different sources is quite a hard thing to do, and um, um, it in, in involves all sorts of actors. It is quite complex. You need uh, technical know-how, and also adapting to climate change is quite a complex thing to do. And I think earlier there was this somehow the idea that if you just use blockchain, if you just use DLT, artificial in, in intelligence, all these barriers will magically dissolve and go away. And that clearly was not to expect and clearly it did, did not happen. And I think if you look who is now left uh, from, from that whole bunch of people who, who tried things in that area, then you see that it's often people who, who uh, it either came from the tech side, but early on um, connected to people who knew a lot about the, the climate side or vice, vice versa. And I think if you only come from one side, you will not uh, su su succeed. And there, there have been um, uh, all these, for instance, ICOs. I'm not sure if, if you still know that concept, these in, in initial coin offerings, where people thought that this, that's a way to get very quickly, very rich. And also that did not happen to a lot of uh, groups. Um, but I think the, the, the essence is base, uh, basically, if you want to do climate action with blockchain, DLT, artificial in, intelligence, sensor, and, and so on, it is what we call the 80-20 rule in that context, which is it is uh, only 20% about having the right tech so, so solution. It's important. You have to make that uh, in, in, in a good way. Um, 
have the right kind of blockchain, uh, which is uh, not expensive, which has the capacity, uh, which has low power consumption, but all that, that's only 20%. And 80% is old fashioned uh, uh, process management, um, working with the right people and also monitoring your, your impact. Great, thank you, Jörg. Um, I think you highlighted a good point that um, a lot of us here at this conference today probably are familiar with is that uh, we're kind of coming out of the trough of disillusionment when it comes to blockchain and the applications that are possible. And again, that's why I'm so excited that we have such a good spread of use cases here um, to talk to that um, kind of particular switch in the blockchain evolution or the hype cycle, if you will. Um, to kind of follow up on that, and maybe a good point uh, to talk to the potential of blockchain beyond the kind of earlier use cases, I'd like to invite Carl um, to add your two cents on, on this question, please. Um, I think we are dealing in a situation where different parts of the blockchain community are addressing different challenges on a different trajectory, and that's reasonable. That's fine. That's there's there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. What it does mean is that, of course, some areas, especially when when we're looking at um, how some applications are more mature, and they're facing a lot of these governance challenges that Jörg, I think, understands and communicates. That hopefully uh, those laggards, uh, and I'd put this. Um, I'd suggest that that my my subsector is a laggard. Although I was very I was very uh, pleased to get two references to what were in effect adaptation uh, actions on the on, on both the weather insurance and then the Signar technology for greenhouses. These are direct applications, but I do think that it's true that um, all people along these trajectories can benefit from learning how other groups, both within the climate action realm, but also, you know, within, you know, outside and within can, can really address, address these issues. Um, I would say that um, one of the issues oftentimes is, uh, I think Alexi mentioned the importance of taxonomy. And I do think that in many respects, um, when you're thinking of governance, you should also be thinking about well, what are things called? Why are they called it? What are the corresponding incentives that can allow for certain, um, certain actions to, uh, to occur? And I'd, I'd put in, into this uh, category adaptation as a term, which wasn't raised by either the weather insurance nor the greenhouse uh, for probably very good reasons. There were a variety of different ways things are called and as they're called different things, it's useful. However, you're going to see uh, in Glasgow, and I think you're going to see as we move towards articulating much more clearly the global goal on adaptation, that uh, there's going to be a call for more finance, both public and private in this realm. And it's going to be important, at least in this realm, just from that perspective, that people articulate the adaptation benefits of their actions and how these match up with both the taxonomies and also how they match up with the governance and incentive regimes and strictures. So I think this can apply more broadly though. Great, thank you so much, Carl. Um, just kind of segueing or staying on the topic of finance, um, I think that we could also hand it over to Alexi and to hear a bit more about your experience um, with that sector in particular, climate finance and how, what the kind of biggest concerns and um, requests are from your clients or uh, stakeholders or partners in that space and, and how your technology or DLT and AI more generally are addressing these concerns. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So um, as, as I underst understood the question, it's more on the, you know, how blockchain right now can solve the problems of the clients that they are communicating. Um, or the barriers to to that. So is it the first uh, point or the second one more? Sorry, I think it's a sort of double 
question with the first being for your the people that you're engaging with um, what are their biggest concerns or re kind of requests um, in the sector so what are their kind of pain points you know and and how can DLT uh, and other kind of related technologies help address those pain points mm. yeah sure so um, you know this DLT uh, and finance story started already some years ago and uh, like from the very start, I think in 2017 or something, 2018, um, there were a lot of reports and articles and quotes that uh, blockchain can be the next uh, kind of infrastructure uh, for the uh, financial markets. And uh, not only for financial markets per se, but also for uh, the green finance. And when we presented our uh, first carbon credit transaction on the blockchain, we talked a lot with the market leaders and all the standard, uh, you know, leaders, including Gold Standard and Vera and the traders and bankers, so many people. And um, somehow I think they, they realized how blockchain can solve some of the market problems. But uh, I cannot say that those market problems were their problems. So there are two types kind of <laughs> problems, right? There are general market problems and as market you know, participants and as citizens, uh, we understand that we need to um, you know, democratize these markets. We need to broaden access to sustainable finance to even smaller projects. And maybe the sweetest spot here would be the you know, medium-sized enterprises that uh, really can benefit from blockchain that can make sustainable finance cheaper and easier uh, for them. But uh, at the same time, back, uh, back in 2017 and 18, uh, some of the market members, I will not name them, but uh, they, they were not running for you know, this democracy in, in the sustainable finance market because they were established market members and they were just you know, okay with what was happening at that time. And uh, they understood what problems can be solved, but at the same time, they had their le legacy systems, IT systems as well, and uh, their established market position. So they didn't want to get rid of intermediaries. They didn't want to get things more transparent because uh, they already had their business, which was you know, up and running. And why, why do you need to change anything? But uh, you know, a few years passed and uh, of course the blockchain became more mature and people understood that it's not scary, it's not some spy software or some, you know, something that tries to steal your money or your data, something that really brings value. And uh, you know, the perception has changed a bit, but at the same time, uh, what is very interesting, and I think it was not mentioned today, is that uh, those smaller projects, they uh, got a sense uh, of blockchain and they've participated in various pilots and lots of you know, smaller countries, regions, projects, companies, they somehow uh, are now using blockchain to launch their own carbon programs, uh, carbon you know, ideas. And uh, it's just an example of the carbon market because it's so illustrative. Uh, so now we can see the true decentralization with, with, within those, you know, smaller projects and countries and regions and uh, more and more, you know, initiatives and platforms and ca even carbon standards are popping up uh, in various uh, parts of the globe. This is because they understood the benefits of the blockchain. They understood they can bring additional transparency. They understood that they can build uh, a quite sophisticated infrastructure that previously was owned only by, I don't know, Deutsche Börse. Uh, they can build it uh, somewhere, you know, uh, without any significant investments. And it could enable exchange. It could enable transparency without all those uh, you know, many, many intermediaries, consultants, verifiers, certifiers, validators, uh, and many, many other guys. And uh, we see that uh, there is a kind of new wave of this, uh, you know, standards and projects and programs. And this is how blockchain is already changing the landscape 
of sustainable finance markets. And of course, right now, the big players understood that it's the safe technology. Uh, how do they need to use it? And they don't want to lose their position uh, to the you know, smaller guys who are entering the market. So they also started to move and uh, started to implement their projects. So maybe it's not uh, the answer to your question, direct answer, because frankly, we have been exploring a lot of benefits of blockchain already, but I think this is something that might be more valuable for our uh, participants today is that blockchain really empowers uh, smaller uh, you know, communities and projects and businesses to be more active, to attract climate financing, to invent their own rules and then uh, connect those uh, rules together. And I think in NADBA, uh, its existence is something that was made for connecting all those initiatives. So I think the mission of NADBA here is, uh, is, is a big issue. And NADBA can play a huge role in uniting the market and creating, facilitating the new landscape for the common good, but not for the <laughs> old school uh, market members who doesn't want any change. Thank you. Great, thank you, Alexi. That was a very comprehensive answer to my question, but I think it's you made a really good point about um, the kind of return, I think, to the, the really collaborative ethos of blockchain and, and, and bringing different um, stakeholders together. And I think that's what's really important about the, the intersection between climate change and blockchain, which is that we are trying to work together towards a common goal. We might all be doing it a little bit differently, but blockchain is one of those ways that we can start to come together and leverage our, our sort of shared intelligence and, and motivation. So I think those are really good points. Thank you, Alexi. Um, I would like to also give a chance for Anna to answer this question about you know, the, the pain points in, in the sector or your area of research that you're looking at. And I know you addressed them a little bit in your presentation, but if you could just go over quickly again. Um, sure. Thank you. Um, well, I guess in a way, it's, it's like if you look at how P2P energy trading markets are built or decentralized energy market, it follows the same concept as blockchain does, right? What we're trying to do is we're trying to empower the individuals and taking away the strong centralized parties. So this is um, how the market is built and structured. And if you look at what blockchain or DLTs do, that's exactly the service they provide. So hence, it's kind of a natural way to choose that as a solution to build and design your markets. But then there's, again, a challenge specifically in the electricity market, that decentralization is good, but in certain situation, when it comes to risky situation, or is it like a blackout instability in the grid? There needs to be a central party that needs to be quickly able to intervene and not within like uh, hours, but sometimes within seconds. So I think on the one side, blockchain does provide or essentially or DLTs follow the nature of peer-to-peer -peer energy trading and therefore can help in a lot of areas of these markets to support but we also need to look for solutions that when something doesn't go right or um, the grid isn't stable, uh, how, how can a central party still intervene? So it needs to be some degree of centralization versus decentralization. And then again, I think I, think I highlighted that in my presentation, we can use blockchain in various areas, right? We can use it for certification, for billing, settlement, um, we could recording identity. So there are various areas in such markets where blockchain can be of significant use. Um, just one example which becomes more and more important all the time is, um, for example, um, the heterogeneity of energy, right? You can have, when you trade energy, energy is not just simply energy, you can trade green energy, you can trade subsidized energy, you can trade energy at specific points in time. And how can you prove that this is actually happening? And there blockchain might be able to, to, to support. Um, and other examples for uh, um, one we do, I mentioned a demand side response, right? You're trying to adjust your load behavior to the current constraints of the grid. How can you prove that someone at a particular point in time actually actively reduced their energy load or increased the energy load depending on, on what has been requested? So these are all um, certificates or we need proof that specific actions happened and blockchain here can really, can really um, help. But again, just to highlight that, um, there are a lot of pilot projects in the area which have started using blockchain and then um, instead of continuing using blockchain, switch to another technology. So blockchain might not be the answer to all our problems. Uh, so I think 
we need, if you look at the current stages of the pilot project, a lot of them implement them current, implement blockchain and DLTs more as a proof of concept, seeing what is possible, what is not possible. A lot of the issues around transaction per, set, per, per second or consumption of um, a bit uh, of blockchains have already been addressed. So we're getting better and better with um, these challenges. And probably my last point here is, um, I think it's the reputation and the adaptability of blockchain. We work with um, energy end users. They don't understand the technology, but when users want to enter markets such as this, um, they want to know what they're dealing with. If you mentioned blockchain in relation to Bitcoin, there's a completely different reputation there and people are not really encouraged to, to take part in such markets. But if you highlight that as a completely, if you like rephrase it or um, highlight the other advantages of um, DLTs, then there's a completely different appreciation of, of this technology in the space. Yeah, I hope this, this answered the question. Yeah, definitely. And Anna, you made an excellent point um, that I think is worth re-emphasizing, which is that um, blockchain isn't a silver bullet, right? And I think all of us here would be um, in agreement with that. Uh, and especially when it comes to climate action, I think the, the power of blockchain and other TDLT, other DLT applications are really enhanced um, by integrating with other technologies, uh, which I think we could get a little bit more insight from Veronica, uh, if you would like to chime in and, and kind of talk about your sector in particular and how um, your use of various emerging technologies are helping to address um, your sector's pain points. Um, yeah, so, you know, one of the, the main issues that we have seen is, you know, when, when some of our clients ask us, you know, about interoperability because of, you know, the, the fragmentation in the, in, in the sector, I would say, you know, everyone is using different types of chains, uh, um, different type of uh, data packages, different type of formats. Um, and so uh, the way we have addressed that so far, we are currently, we started using uh, Ethereum and then we switched to, uh, to Hyperledger. Uh, we will still be using a, a layer two type of network, but uh, we are addressing this issue by connecting our architecture with Cactus, which is uh, part of Hyperledger. Um, so I think this uh, plugged in and play type of architectures are going to be extremely meaningful in the future to really be able to integrate and, and standardize uh, all the different actors uh, that are out there and that are trying to, to have some uh, meaningful business models. Great, thank you so much, Veronica. Um, and I am conscious of time, but I definitely want to hand the mic over to Gianfranco to uh, have an opportunity to answer this question as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great, uh, great pitch about uh, what actually matters for the end customers and uh, people who is not necessarily aware of blockchain itself, um, because at the end of the day, they are looking for solutions to their needs, right? And um, one of the things that we found most is that they are aware of the machine economy to some point because they see lots of videos of machines doing things uh, and machines jumping and dancing around. But they say, how can we reuse that technology and how can we adopt that, uh, that it seems out there? And um, how can we optimize the processes? That's, that's, ki that's kind of the main the main requ request behind it. And it's not only blockchain, as uh, many of you have said, it's a combination of technologies. It's merging uh, internet of things, artificial intelligence, software development, uh, the, the DLT industry as well. So each of them, each of these technologies uh, solve a specific part of the end-to-end -end solution. And um, in the case of um, what, what, what we see uh, very common is that traceability it's an important aspect to, to detect and identify, okay, uh, the procedence of the goods, uh, the, the temperature, for example, on a container that has to ship out the, uh, the food, um, 3,500 uh, kilometers. So if at some point the temperature breaks, uh, the end customer could be eating a, a product that is not uh, consumable or might be damaged. So that type of information 
uh, it's been monitored, it's been captured. And uh, what DLT brings to the table is essentially the confidence that the data hasn't been tampered once, it once the data reaches the ledger. But then there is the other concern, what if the data is simulated? What if uh, someone is playing behind the scenes and sending false data just to say, I'm fulfilling the, requ I'm fulfilling the requirements? So there is also efforts that are going in parallel to these uh, DLTs that will allow uh, data confidence in the next uh, years. It's not happening right now, but again, DLT itself won't solve these problems. It's a combination of uh, all of these technologies. And at the end, the, the idea is to maximize efficiencies, uh, self-optimization of the processes, and obviously um, uh, taking care of the planet. Thank you so much. So we are almost out of time, which means we're not gonna get a chance to get to our other um, panel questions that at least we had sort of prepared for. But what I would like to do instead with a little bit of time we have left is give an opportunity to all of our panelists to give a quick um, one sentence wrap up. Okay, just end. just quick, quickly. I, I think um, the discussion showed also the importance of of um, fora like in 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 Outba or the climate ledger in, in in initiative and this um, blockchain week because it's really um, by connecting these deep different thoughts that we can move forward. Thank you, Jörg. And I think I dropped out for a second, so sorry about that. Um, and Carl, final words, please. I was just saying, I think we have to think about this holistically. We've got to think about the climate challenge as uh, something that is broad based and um, we need to avail ourselves of all of the lessons learned from different parts of it and um, and make sure that we um, we not just do blockchain for blockchain's sake, but do it to solve real problems. Thank you, Alexi. Sure. Um, I think the adoption is uh, is coming. It's almost there. So finally, I think uh, many things to which we fought for, <laughs> they are, <laughs> you know, uh, executing. So uh, it's great to keep together, form new market standards, help each other, uh, and uh, make the world and Europe uh, much better and sustainable place. Thank you. Anna? Um, I actually have to agree with uh, Jörg. You mentioned it earlier that I think uh, kind of uh, opportunities or concepts such as a NADVA are super useful. I mean, we can see that I come from academia and we have the research happening as an academic world, but then we have all of the pilot projects. And I think it's important to bring all of them together. And just from the energy training task force and the interviews we've conducted, we actually learned so much of what the lessons learned are. And I think it's important to uh, communicate this know-how in the community so that we can learn from the mistakes and improve the technology to, to suit it to our needs. Thank you so much. Um, Gianfranco? Uh, yeah, so... Um, standards are very important. We are defining the standards for the next probably 100 years right now with DLT industries. And a very good example is uh, when the Roman Empire defined the standard roads that we use today. So when we have to move equipment such, an, such as an A380 win, we have to chop the win and move it around. So uh, this, in the same fashion, if we take the wrong decisions right now, uh, that will be reflected in the uh, in the future. So we have to think ahead uh, how things are being defined, how things are being settled, and uh, that will bring lots of opportunity for the future generations. Thank you. And last but not least, Veronica. Thank you. Yeah, so I think, you know, um, I want to also bring into the table the fact that all these investment flows that we are needing for transition, for the transition towards a reduction in, in carbon emissions uh, from now to you know, 2030, 2050, um, I think it would be really, really important to see governments uh, having the right incentives 
uh, for private players to really get in and, and get on board. Uh, and for that, one needs really very, very clear rules, very uh, clear set of uh, regulations, um, and again, incentives that have to be uh, committed and uh, for these two uh, very, very different sectors to, to work together and be able to achieve what we need to achieve in the next decade. Excellent, thank you. So just to quickly wrap up, uh, a big thank you again to the Slovenian presidency may, of may the council. I, dear Chiara. Oh yes, I? Rosella, please. Yeah. <laughs> I was uh, starting with uh, a frame and I was listening uh, all your contribution. They were really very, very interesting. Let me have a kind of uh, eagle high. And um, you were uh, uh, um, pointing out uh, um, pretty often uh, fragmentation, but I have to say um, for climate change right now, after the visionary era and going grounded uh, in this new scenario that need clarity, uh, the blockchain can play a very, very interesting role, matrix connecting and giving unity. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, very interesting uh, panel. Thank you so much, Rosella. So I will quickly wrap up by saying thank you to the organizers. Thank you to our panelists and our keynote speaker. And thank you to the audience. This was a really important discussion. Um, if you would like to get in touch with Bar or myself about ANAPA and the work that we do for the Climate Action Working Group, please feel free to reach out to either of us on LinkedIn. And likewise for our panelists, um, if you would like to learn more about their work, um, reach out to them on LinkedIn. And I would just like to thank you again and wish everybody a great rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.